two more weeks. No, three. So she has three weeks in Kenya, two left to go, and so uh, she'll be changing first when she gets back. There's no way that can't not affect you that way. So we're praying for her safety, for the team's safety, and uh, for God to open up their eyes and for the things that they'll be able to see as well as they go home that way. So we just kind of want to gather this morning to take some time to celebrate our graduates, and so I want to invite uh, Catherine to come on, and I want to invite Angel to come on, and Jesse to come down, and, and just kind of nail this rail for the easiest one, because they're all kind of right here. And then I want to invite everybody who'd like to just kind of lay their hands on them to come up. We're going to have a word of blessing over them, so if you want to lay your hands on them, and then kind of spread out. Um, yeah, just spread out, so they can spread out. Anyway, that's my little bit. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's good. That's good. It's all right. Because they're kind of, what's going to happen is when folks are come behind you, you'll get a bit of an ingress in here. So, there we go. And I have to get a picture at 11 o'clock. These folks will be here. So, before I send it for you, I'll get a picture. So. Uh, I'm just going to get a picture once I get to real quick so I can show up.
Congratulations. Big day, big celebration as we come together and all the things that we do. Let's stand and greet our guests and friends. Say hello. I'm so glad you're here today to worship God this morning.
God, for your presence in this place. Thank you that you are the God who is sovereign over all creation. So we look at a world that with earthly eyes seems so out of control, but we thank you that you are the sovereign God. And we trust you that you are indeed at work in ways we can't see. God of all the earth, we thank you that you are tender towards the needs of your children.
turn to you in the power of the Holy Spirit to fill us and to use us and to guide us until we become this morning. We, we're thankful for allowing us to connect and worship in this place and connect to your presence in a powerful way. And helping us to grow and become more and more like you in all that we say, all that we do, and all that we are. We want to become better followers. Help us to serve. You are a God who serves with your hands and with your heart. You call us to do exactly the same. And help us to go. To go out into the world and share the good news that you've given to us, that you gave to the disciples of Paul who made those journeys just to share the word. And we also make the same kind of journey in our life, sharing the gospel. And so through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, we bring all these things to you. All that we have and all that we are. And we ask that you would use us and use our gifts. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And the people of God said together, Amen. You can see it. Invite our kids to head to the back for kids worship with your teachers. So head to the back.
that's a, also coming as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Precious God, as we come here this morning, pour your spirit into us. As we begin this new time of talking about Paul's life and travels, help us to see in Paul's life our own lives. Help us to find our place to, to go alongside of Paul and understand his journey and, and his ministry and how it is that it speaks to us and where we are in our lives. Convict us and challenge us. Go with us in the places we need to go. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And we pray together as the people of God. Amen. Today we begin a new sermon series, The Call. The life and time of the Apostle Paul, based on the book by Adam Hamilton. And I encourage you to pick that and read it along. You just go, go one more. Go one more. Take this. Me. Here. One more. There you go. So that's the book cover, so if you want to pick that up at Amazon or something like that, it's a great book. It's a, yeah, maybe like you have, like I have not really spent a lot of time with Paul and actually going through all the journeys of Paul. And so I'd encourage you to pick it up. It's a great way uh, to go along with this for the next uh, several weeks. Paul's four missionary journeys took the gospel around the entire Roman world. This is a map of those journeys. And each one of those lines represents one of the journeys. And he went a lot of places. Thirteen of the New Testament's 27 books are attributed to Paul. And one half of the Acts of the Apostles is devoted to telling his story alone. When we read Paul's letters, we see his humanity shining through. He is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he's a man who has strong convictions. One who was aware of his critics and regularly had to defend himself. He had physical ailments, faced his share of adversity. He is an about Jew and is a Roman citizen, aware of what's important and what the Romans believed. And Adam's book will take us on a chronological journey through Paul's life. And the question we want to ask every week is how does this part of Paul's story? Speak to my story today. How does this part of Paul's story speak to my story today? Now Adam gives us great background in Paul's beginnings. His parents named him Saul after the first king of Israel, who like Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. His father and mother were part of what's called the Jewish diaspora, where Jews were spread out across the Roman world after Israel was conquered. And they were living in Tarsus, which is located about 10 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. And actually, I got a slide that I didn't make. I didn't make a note of that there. That's my fault. Tarsus is over there. You see it where it says Tarsus. A major city of 200,000 people in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Think as large as New York City in its day and time. It was a free city. And that meant that they were free to govern themselves, to make their own money, and most of all, they didn't pay Roman taxes. We know that Paul was born a Roman citizen in Acts 22-26. But only 10% of the Roman Empire had been granted citizenship. So that means it is likely that Paul's parents were wealthy. Well, they were important landowners. And they probably owned a tent-making business because we know that Paul was trained as a tent-maker. And young Saul, whose Roman name was Paul, probably went to Greco-Roman elementary and middle school growing up until the age of 13, before being sent to study in Jerusalem. He would have learned the art of writing and the use of language along with Greek rhetoric and logic. Then probably Saul went to study under Gamal, one of the leading first century rabbis, all the way up until the age of 20. You can think about it as going away to college, like some of our college, high school and college graduates are doing. You might be thinking, why is Pastor Jeremy giving me a history lesson on the details of Paul's early life? 
I'm not in class, and I don't like history in the first place, and it just drags me down. Well, it's, it's simple. Because our early life, our early life experiences shape much of who we are, good or bad. Paul was a man of his times. He was shaped by his education. His experience is like his profound conversion experience and his years of reflecting upon the meaning of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And think about Moses, who grew up in Pharaoh's household and became the ideal person to lead the Israelites to freedom from Egypt. Think about your own background story, the things that have happened to you in your life that have made you who you are. They are a part of each one of us, whether we like them or not. They define who we are. And so the first thing we learn from Paul's story is that God uses the puzzle pieces of our life to achieve the plan of God. See, all those things that happen to us along the way, God uses them to put them together to be able to do what it is that God calls us to do, even the bad stuff. God uses the puzzle pieces of our life to achieve the plan of God. And then something I just said this weekend when I was in licensing school at Virtual Springs teaching new pastors as they go into the ministry is that I believe that Christ is at his strongest when we are at our weakest. Amen? See, Christ is at his strongest when we're at our weakest. Our scars. The most difficult parts of our lives is what Jesus uses the most. So the most meaningful things usually happen to us, good or bad. And so those scars are what Christ can use the same way that his scars heal us. The same way that he gives us new life through his pain, through his suffering. And so the first time we read about Paul's life is actually in Acts 7. Jesus had been crucified, resurrected, and ascended to heaven just a couple of years earlier. And now, we begin to see that the Christ movement has exploded all over Jerusalem. And the Jewish disciples of Jesus are calling themselves the followers of the way. They would not call themselves Christians until much later. And in Acts 6, one of the leaders, Stephen, was arrested and placed on trial. We see a bit of his story in Acts 7. He was convicted of blasphemy, condemned him to death. So in Acts 7, we hear Paul mentioned by his Hebrew name, a young man named Saul. And in Acts 8, 1, Paul may have been 20 years old. But think about this. Being 20 years old and being given the approval to kill someone. That's quite young. What was it that motivated Paul to volunteer for the job of stoning Stephen? That the guy job you want to volunteer for? Hey, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll take care of him. Let, let me do it, let me do it. I want to stone him. I don't have time in today's sermon to actually explain stoning to you. Except it's not throwing stones, they drop a rock on your chest. And that is a kill you to get another one. And that is a kill you, then they start the whole deal throwing stones at you. I didn't know that until I started doing the work of studying. Paul's the first one to drop the first stone. It's his job. And so, and what about then going house to house to arrest the followers of the way? I want that job. Can I arrest people who are trying to serve Jesus? Can we eradicate them? Can we wipe them out? But his writings seem to suggest that Paul was eager to impress the Jewish ruling council, make a name for himself. You ever been blinded by ambition? Try to make a name for yourself? Some people are willing to be blind and are willing to do whatever it takes to get ahead. It wasn't God who wanted him to do that. It was his ambition and his unwavering religious convictions working together 
that drove him. And so the second thing we learn from Paul's story is we have to be careful that our convictions don't overcome our compassion in listening to God. Say it again. We have to be careful that our convictions don't overcome our compassion of our, list, or our listening to God. We have to submit our ambition to God. Everything we need that needs to be that we do needs to be done for God's glory, not our own. Amen? Amen. You see, we need to hold our ambition and religious beliefs with humility. And never forget the greatest commandment of Jesus was to do what? Love our God, love our neighbor. It's too bad that our general conference delegates couldn't learn that lesson with each other over the last two weeks that they met together. See, Adam Hamilton certainly knows about that because he's a big name, big name pastor. He says that he uses Psalm 115.1 as a breath prayer, which is a prayer you can say in one breath. And it says this, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name, give glory. There's a contemporary song by that same kind of lyrics as well. And everything that we do should make God famous and not us. Now, my brother over here thinks he has a copyright on that, but I'm pretty sure he stole from somebody else. But our job is to make God famous, not ourselves. You see, everything we should do should make God famous and not us. And if we don't surrender our ambitions to God's purposes, and we're willingly to do, uh, willingly to do whatever it takes to get ahead, then eventually we're going to fail. We're going to fall. We put ourselves first, eventually we will fall. But if we do surrender, then God can do great things through each one of us. And Paul was about to learn that very lesson. Acts 26, Paul with his letter in hand from the high priest, authorizing arrest of the followers of the way, began going to Damascus. While he was on the road, he was stopped in his tracks, and his life was changed forever. Now, it's been suggested the light from heaven was a bolt of lightning, and obviously the bolt of lightning struck near you or around you, it would get your attention pretty quick. But whatever it was, this this light, he was terrified by it, and he's blinded by it. And in the midst of the light, Paul heard Jesus speaking to him. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goats. Say, what? Sounds painful, doesn't it? Maybe a little too private, but that's not what it means. You see, what is a goat? A goat is a stick with a pointed end and sometimes a hook used to prod cattle to move in the direction their owner wants them to go. So do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying that he's been prodding Paul in the right direction for some time. But Paul has not been paying attention. And that his failure to go the right way was hurting Paul. And Jesus follows. Just think about that. God is prodding us on a regular basis, seeking to lead us, to guide us, to move us to do God's will and to live as God's disciples. And you see, God's prodding is something gentle and persistent. And I think sometimes it takes a little more to get our attention. Sometimes it even seems we need to electrify cattle prod. Just kind of shove into us to make sure we get going where we're going. Right, Davis? Yep, pretty much. <laughs> Say that slide, by the way, but I'll let it slide out. So, you need a cattle prod to get us going. Have you felt God's folks and prodding? Just ignored them? Yeah. 
Are you being goaded by God? Are you paying attention? Paul's story tells us we need to pay attention listen to God's prodigies. We need to pay attention. Listen to God's prodigies in our life. And so, so here is Paul, blinded, led by his men to Damascus in a home on Straight Street. And Paul sat there for three days. And the three days is very important. Unable to see physically and also spiritually. And he was unwilling to eat or drink, and God was working on him in silence. And he came to a disturbing fact in his life that his desire to serve God was distorted by his ambition. It can happen to all of us, especially pastors. You can lose track very quickly of wanting to go to this place or that place or to serve here or to be successful, all the other things, and lose track of the fact that his desire to serve God is not motivated by any of those things. The desire to serve God is to serve God alone. And meanwhile, God was prodding someone else. And Acts, Acts 9, the Lord told him to go to Straight Street. And then pray for Paul to see again. That's exactly what happened. Now, do you notice something about Paul's conversion? It was the result of both an experience of Christ and also Ananias sharing it with him. You see, most of us don't have this blinding light kind of experience on the Damascus Road. But we do experience Christ personally in our lives in some way. We feel his love, his touch, his words. But we also have an eyes that come alongside of us in life, who help to make Christ real for us, who help to bring us closer in to Christ. <coughs> Paul is now about 25. He was on the fast track to being somebody in Judaism. Maybe he and his parents thought that one day he'd be the first Tarsus Jew who was on the Sanhedrin. And everything he had worked for his entire life went up in a flash of light and a voice. What a radical shift to go from being a persecutor of the way to being a follower of the way. You see, it was, that, it was that conversion that made Paul's witness the most compelling. Maybe you've ever maybe you've had the experience of trying to argue or convince someone to the faith. That almost never works to argue somebody or try to convince them to believe. The best way we can bring someone to Christ is by sharing our experience, by sharing our faith in Jesus. And how that's made a different person. I'm different because I follow Christ. And this is what it means to me. It's hard to discount someone's experience of Jesus and their life transformation. You see, they couldn't argue away Paul's conversion. They couldn't argue away his experience. He was blind, but now he saw. It doesn't mean that things that went well for him. Acts 9 talks about him and the plot to kill him. And they have to get him out of Damascus. But there's another part of the story that I was not very familiar with. and Maybe you're not either. Paul reports in Galatians 1, 17, that after escaping Damascus, he went at once to Arabia and then returned to Damascus. And that one simple sentence is easy to miss. But apparently, Paul spent three years in that one sentence. Three years. You see, most of Elijah <coughs> sojourned for a time in the wilderness. This is John the Baptist did. Of course, Jesus spent 40 days in prayer there. And in much the same way, Paul fled to the wilderness for three years years. 
And he probably spent those three years reflecting why this happened to him. How is he going to make sense of what he just experienced? He took time to work out his theology. He might also have been starting churches and preaching as a missionary. And Adam says in the book that Paul's three-year silent period reminds us that we all must have times of silence and solitude for prayer, reflection, and listening for God's voice. We went to Birch of the Springs for a one-day vacation to go teach and then hang around, stay in a room, get up and do nothing, look out the door and watch the breeze. One day, it's all your heart out. But there's a difference. So you've been to Bershaw. You always want to go back. Why? You have something about going away to Bershaw the Springs or some other place like that that just takes you outside of your natural realm, frees you up, allows you to be in a place where God can really speak. You see, we, we all need those times or we're going to become anemic in our spiritual life. Christ's blood that flow through us because we're so constricted, because we're just so undernourished. We drag ourselves through life without ever really letting Christ's blood and the power of the Holy Spirit flow through us. We will be the best that we can be. We, we put it off. When's the last time you took time away from the busyness of life or solitude? For reading, for prayer, <coughs> for reflection. You know, the times in my life when I feel God is most distant are actually when I'm most distant from God. You hear what I'm saying? The times when I feel that God is most distant in my life is not because God's moved away. It is because I have moved away. When I feel the most distant, I put that distance there. And I'm the only one that can take it away. I'm the only one that can go back in closer again. It's the I am, in this case, of me. And then Paul reports in Galatians 1, 18 and 19, after three years of doing this, that he went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. Wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall with Peter and Paul in the room trying to talk to one another, trying to make sense of all that's been going on after three years? Peter was an uneducated fisherman with three years of Jesus' stories and of his eyewitness accounts. Paul was highly educated in the scriptures and in Greek thought, and he had spent three years reflecting on the significance of Jesus using his education, but he'd never been with Jesus one-on-one -on -one in person. They were definitely not like two peas in a pod. Both Peter and Paul had important pieces of the gospel from which the other could benefit if they could only work together. I like that remark, doesn't it? It's easy to imagine because of their perspectives that there was tension in the room. Maybe Paul is 10 to 15 years junior to Peter. Maybe he feels a little insecure. Paul even issued a rebuke of Peter and seemed to lack respect for Jesus' lead disciple and apostle. Paul is human after all. And sometimes he lacked grace like all of us. So Barnabas, so, and during that visit, he was there 15 days, so obviously they got along fairly well. But during that visit in Acts 9, it tells us this. He got in a debate with the Greek-speaking Jews as well. He followed the debate everywhere he went. And they tried to kill him. So the believers had to actually, Barnabas and the others, put Paul on a boat back to Tarsus. Because he's in so much trouble. <clears throat> he's taking the last train out of town. And then, he probably moved back in with his parents. Say, what? <laughs> Have you your kids living with you or something like that at some point in your life? Yeah. He had to move back in with his parents when he went back home. Paul did. 
And so it looks like in Galatians 2.1 that after 14 years, 14 years, I pray for all parents in this room that you don't have 14 years. Your what? Thank you. Your thank you. Angel will be like, yes. She's smiling. He went up again to Jerusalem. So it looks like that somewhere between that Paul lived with his parents for at least 10 to 14 years in his parents' basement before he started his missionary journeys. That's a long time. After all this happened to him, have you ever caught that in the story? Did all this time just spent just sitting around, making tents, going home at night, just doing his job? I guess it's better than a man down by the river, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to think about this. He's probably still preaching and teaching all around the area as he can. But I'm sure this must have been disappointing to Paul. He must have grown during this time. And often does it seem like that our greatest wisdom building experiences are those that come in the midst of our disappointment and our adversity and the dreaded W word, waiting. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Do we like to wait? Hey, we like to wait. Who likes to wait out here? You like to wait? No one? No one likes to wait. We don't have to wait for anything. We have to wait for something in life to get upset about it. Whether it's five minutes or it's two hours or God forbid, 10 to 14 years. <coughs> See, our faith often grows deeper, but we, we might not recognize it at the time. He must have wondered what happened to that dramatic call that he heard from Ananias that said, you'll be God's witnesses to all the world of what you've seen and heard. Can you imagine getting that call and then 10 years later, you're supposed to be your parents' basement waiting for something to happen in your life? And Adam says something that hit me profoundly. He says this. It is interesting to note how often in Scripture there is a delay between the moment of God's call or the experience of God's presence or a vision that seems to come from God about the future and when these things actually come to pass. Think about Abraham who was told that God would make him a great nation and have many descendants. He heard that when he was 75. But he was 100 when Isaac was finally born. 25 years of in-between time. Or Joseph, who at 17 had great visions of greatness, but not until being sold as a slave and put into prison did he as the age of 30 become Pharaoh's right hand man and then it was another 7 years after that when he'd be in the right place at the right time to help his family or Moses who waited for 40 years tending goats before coming back to free the Hebrews or David waiting 25 years to be king after he's been anointed much younger or Jesus, who knew at the age of 12 he had a unique relationship with God, but he would wait 18 years later to finally start doing his three years of ministry. Was God at work during Abraham's 25 years? Or Joseph's 20? Or Paul's 10? Was God at work when we had to wait for over 15 years, we say now, about selling the property and trying to make it all work and happen? But now seems like it's all in the rearview mirror now. as much as God's at work during the times when things are going on. Amen? You see, from Scripture, we learn that this is God's pattern for those God used to change the world. Our own founder, John Wesley, spent most of his 20s and 30s striving to do God's work, work in the world, but he's a miserable failure. He's a failure. He was a horrible, horrible failure. And finally, after his great disappointment, God unleashed him into a revival across all of England and across America and beyond the world that lasts to this day and the African countries where it's growing by leaps and bounds, this message. The 
you ever experience an in-between time in your life and you have to just wait? It's hard. It's hard to be in that place. Maybe you're in one of those right now. And the last thing Paul's story tells us is God is at work in the in-between time. You can trust that. Amen? Amen. God's at work in the in-between time. You can trust that. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other, even when you don't know where it is that you're going. Moses, David, Jesus, Paul, and Wesley never stopped dreaming, thinking, and working as they waited in the waiting. God was preparing them, transforming them, readying them for their work. So you see, if Paul had to wait 10 to 14 years to really start moving to do all this that he did. Then know that God is still working in each one of our lives. And that Paul's journeys we're going to take over the next couple weeks have a lot to teach us about being a Christian and about living the Christian life. And I hope you'll soak in his journeys in his life and take something for your own life that can help you wherever you might be. Amen. The body of Christ broken and given in love for us. And the table of the last supper. Hey, eat this in my body, which is given for you to do this in remembrance of me. His blood poured out for sacrifice, for love, for forgiveness, for new life. Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. I give my life for you, that you may have new life. So I invite you to come to the table this morning to to remember that this thing that we celebrate goes around the world. People always ask why we're band-aids on my globe, my world. But in confirmation one year, we place band-aids on the things that the world is hurt by. And we place them around the countries of the world to remember that we are a broken world. That Christ came to give new life and to bandage the wounded and to bring a balm to those who need healing and to release us from all the things we can't release ourselves from. It is that table I invite you to this morning to be a part of. Everyone is welcome to it. And as you come forward, I invite you to kneel at these rails and to think about where it is the call in your life is. Call it means ministry. Call it mean what is God calling you to do in your perspective thing? I met with somebody who was talking about that they did a certain job and they didn't feel like they were called to do it. And they explained to me the whole job. And I was like, do you realize you're in the right place at the right time to help people be able to do this? And because you follow Christ, you bring a whole different level to it of trustworthiness. No Jerry Newton and he's looking for a straight administration. Christ still bread. We help folks every day. We all do. If we see what we do as being a calling, not a job, or something to pay the bills. It's Christ who calls us to this table this morning. Let those come who are serving in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, may this bread and this juice become for us a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. Pour out your spirit now on them, make them be for us the living reminders of a God who loves us beyond all measure. In Jesus Christ's name we pray.
kicked in the goes, and he just stood and cried in. Let God do that. Yeah. Keep moving the way God wants you to move. Listen to the prodigies that God's trying to do to get you to go the right direction. And listen, because He will speak to you. You're willing to listen.